Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest podcast. And this is on the misdiagnosis, pearls and pitfalls. And of all the talks I'm asked to give more frequently now, it's this talk. I think it's something that all of us are concerned about. All of us know that making mistakes in diagnosis is something that's part of doing radiology, but it's something we try to avoid. I mean, our goal is to be 100% accurate 100% of the time, though we know, as in this typo here, which was very hard to do, may I say, it's an impossibility, but that's our goal. When you ask the question, how often are things missed? Look at this article, Fool Me Twice, uh, Perceptual per per Perpetuated Errors, recent article. In the daily radiology practice, the rate of interpretation error is between 3 and 4%. However, of the radiology studies that contain abnormalities, the error rate is even higher, averaging the 30% range. So what does that mean? That means if the study's normal, I might read it correctly, and if the study's abnormal, I'm going to read it incorrectly almost one-third of the time. That is really scary. And if you look further in this article, uh, the majority of errors were under-reading. That means the finding was simply missed. And we know this ourselves. If you see a liver mass, then you discuss and you think to yourself, well, it's a hemangioma, hepatoma, hepatic adenoma, FNH. You try to go through differential diagnosis based on the findings, but at least you're in the differential diagnosis ballpark. If you don't see the liver mass, you're not in any ballpark. And this fact that Errors are typically under-reading or not seeing a finding is not new. Article by McGreedy in Clinical Radiology. Majority of errors of false negative interpretations and occur during interpretation of CT studies. And he described a number of recurring false negative CT errors, which also makes their point that it's not like we make a million different errors, but we make certain specific ones. Like GI tract tumors are missed, pancreatic tumors are missed, PEs are missed, vascular lesions, bone lesions, omental lesions, incidental abnormality missed on a targeted study, lesion missed at the periphery, and you go on and on. And these are some of the lessons. And now this author said perhaps we should double read, but I'm sure you would say, as probably we would say, it's hard enough to read the first time these days. Double reading is just not something that's going to work. Now, I will admit at Hopkins, we do lots of 3Ds, so in many ways we do double reading, and that indeed improves our accuracy. Um, another article, this article looking at malpractice cases, our data indicates that interpretive errors rather than communication errors are by far the most uh, generic cause of malpractice suits against radiologists. So Again, it's this detection of lesions, the fact we don't see things, and there are many reasons, and we'll discuss them. But one of the things we learned, and those other articles show as well, is that the misdiagnoses, even with the best of people, occur over and over with the same type of things, the same errors. And so the good thing about that, in my mind at least, is if you know what errors you're making, perhaps you can look more carefully and not make that error. And this article, we talked about the errors we make and how we uh, work to try to avoid those errors. If I looked at things from a generic perspective, why do we miss things? Well, it's a poor search strategy. Abdominal CT, rule out pancreatitis, pancreatic mass, liver mass, you name it, but we don't pay that much attention to the lung basis and miss the PE. You're looking at the bowel. Is the bowel over-distended or under-distended? Is there a mass there? You're not looking that carefully. You assume it's okay. We make assumptions. You're looking at a trauma case, and there's a very well-defined, relatively low-density mass in the kidney, and you assume it's a cyst, and you just blow by it in this 45-year-old. And if you put a cursor there, it was 55 Hounsfield units and was a papillary renal cell carcinoma. We all know that we read the requisitions, and sometimes we focus on the requisitions, and sometimes, not a great surprise, that unsuspected pathology is there, and we miss it because we're looking at the requisition and what the requisition tells us to look at. Now, I'm not saying don't look at the requisition. It's very important for us to get as much clinical information as possible, but you need to read the study in some sense twice. Look at the entire study, even without the history per se, and then look at it with the specific findings. Incidental findings can occur in every organ and every anatomic zone, and they're often missed. Remember, the older the patient, the more likely there's an important incidental finding. And I put this last thing down because I've noticed that when I find misdiagnosis, it's never the radiologist, the faculty person by themselves. It's always with the fellow or resident, so the co-reading. And you could say, why is that? You know, you would think that two people are looking at it, 
You should be more accurate, not less accurate. But what I've noticed, and I've spoken to some of my colleagues, is, and I've spoken to people at other institutions, when you read with a resident or fellow, you're not really reading the study in a sense, the way you always do. You're really checking them. So you don't do the same technique that you always do for reading the studies yourself. It may not be centered in front of the monitor. You kind of review what they're telling you, but you're not looking at it the same way you would look at it yourself when you're dictating it. And in fact, if I time things, I guarantee you spend less time looking at the images than you do when you're looking at things yourself. So those are some of the basics. Now let's be more specific. We talk about a full field of view images and a targeted view. Now the reason you do targeted imaging like in cardiac is because you want to be able to get the highest spatial resolution. But it's very important to recognize that you need to do that. You need to target the images. We talk about targeting the heart for coronary artery evaluation. And you can see in this case, the patient's disease in the LED and right coronary artery, the plaque present. Um, no critical stenosis, but a very nice study. And the targeted images look pretty good. But we, t we always say you need to reconstruct the full field of view to look at the extra cardiac structures. Because in this case, when you did that, you found a mass in the right lower lung, which was a carcinoma. Obvious carcinoma, not very tricky, but there's no chance you're going to see this with a targeted image. You remember in the early days of cardiac CT, the cardiologist wanted to read the cardiacs, but didn't want to look at the lungs. So they said, don't read the lungs. Phillips made a scanner that blocked out the lungs. That was really a good idea. Well, fortunately, the insurers said, listen, look at the lungs. You've scanned the patient. The radiation has been used. Look at the lungs. A couple articles have shown that when you do a coronary CT, you have about 60 to 70 percent of the lungs. So you're pretty good. You've got two-thirds of the lungs. And also, people who get cardiac CT are often in the same population who are at risk for lung cancer, patients in their 50s and 60s. And it's not just looking at the uh, chest where this is true. In the spine, a great article by Lee uh, made the point that unless you look at the full field of view on lumbar spine CT exams, you're going to miss significant findings. In their article, extra spinal findings were present in 40% of adult outpatients undergoing lumbar spine CT exams for back pain. Now, most of these were um, not very significant, but without the full field of view, you would miss them in the majority of cases. And although most of them were not very important, maybe a small aneurysm, maybe some renal calculi, but other cases, there were renal cell carcinomas and TCCs and CLL and sarcoid and aortic aneurysms. So 4.3%, that's not insignificant, had important findings. And perhaps the reason for the patient's back pain is not a lumbar disc, but an aortic aneurysm. You need to reconstruct the full field of view. By a show of hands, how many people reconstruct the full field of view? Well, I don't see many hands going up. Maybe you should think about it when you go home. What about this question? Do you need to look at the topogram or scout view on every CT scan? I'm not talking every once in a while. I'm talking 100% of the time. Now, you remember in the old days, that is when we had film, you tended to look at the topogram because it was the first image the technology shot, and the last image was a topogram with the lines. But you looked at it even quickly. But now we tend not to look at it because it's in a separate folder, and oh my God, it takes extra time to open. Now, in this case, this was initially read as um, some contrast in the colon in this post-op patient, and you realize this is a barrier marker on a sponge that was left behind, and here the topogram would have probably helped you out. Now, there's an article by Dr. Berlin looking at this question, and I'll tell you why he wrote the article, but he called me up a couple years back and asked me if I read uh, the topogram on every case, and I sort of said, uh, no. I asked a few of my colleagues, did they do it? One person read, raised their hand, and I said, put your hand down. That's, you never look at the topogram. So I spoke to other institutions, same thing. People don't look at the topogram. So there was an article here done by Pam Johnson, who, looked at, who had two of our colleagues, Bill Scott and Bob Gale, two terrific plain film people, look at over 2,000 scout views, consecutive scout views, to see whether or not you would find something on the scout view that wasn't on the CT scan. Now, you can understand why. How would this happen? Well, 
you do a CT scan of the abdomen, but you got some of the chest in there and there's a lung nodule or something's at the edge of the field or beyond the field. So it's not surprising. And in this article, major findings were present in 257 or 436 of cases, depending on the reader. Most of the findings were confirmed or refuted by the CT scan. However, 15 and 48 of the major findings were not included in the CT field of view. And so you would have missed pathology in between 2 and 5% of cases. Cardiomegaly was the most common finding, but beyond that, it's AVN, it's the root dilatation, it's fracture, it's cancer, are all possibilities. And so that article said the scalphia showed a significant finding in up to 23% of cases using an anatomic region imaged by CT. In as many as 2% of cases, the abnormality disclosed in the scalp view was not included in the CT field of view. So what's the conclusion? The results of the study support the routine inspection of the scalp view, especially for the detection of pathologic findings in anatomic areas not imaged by CT. Very important conclusion. Here's that conclusion again. Well, what did Dr. Berlin say to this? Well, he said there's no ACR guidelines. There's no routine interpretation uh, standards. But, however, if it's 2% of the time, and use the low number, 2%, and we say 2% of the patients have an issue on their topogram, but you're having 85 million scans, that means 1.7 million patients have a major finding that's not seen on their study. That can be very, very serious. And so when you look at his uh, conclusion, reasonable medical practice, logic, and medical legal, as well as ethical considerations confirm their conclusion. So he's saying very clearly, you must look at the topogram. I spoke to, I gave this talk at a meeting of the Maryland Realized Society. One of the senior members of the uh, ACR board was there. And he said, based on this information, it's going to have to become the standard of care. So I would be ahead of the game and start looking at your topograms. It's a bit painful and you tend not to do it, but you got to give it a shot. Now, what else? Generically, I'll just say that PACs can be very painful. We have an old PAC system. We're replacing it. It's hard to complain about a PAC system that's more than 10 years old. You know, it's like complaining about your car and saying it was never any good. But with our system now, sometimes old films don't appear. The comparisons aren't there. Retrieval is so slow that I don't want to wait. Uh, information from old studies are, are not available. And so it's often the limiting factor. In many institutions, PAC systems and their capabilities pose a risk for the patient and for the radiologist. Most PAC systems have ancient technology. Even EPIC, we spent a billion dollars, that's written in mumps, which was from the VA from like 1,000 years ago. Well, you know, you need to be able to have state-of-the-art workstations, state-of-the-art PAC systems, state-of-the-art risk systems. We don't have that in radiology or in medicine these days, and that's something that can prove a challenge to us and our patients. It's interesting how this whole idea about information. There was this article I read about uh, consultation at a tertiary center led to changes in about one-third of patients with pancreatic cancer, and we've had very good results also with our multidisciplinary conferences. But I was curious, that was a pretty high number, and they said, of course, that it, you know lung cancer was the number one cancer type, breast, pancreas were all up there, but you say, gosh, these are high numbers. But then you read the rest of the article, and they made the point that they did not measure the quality of the radiology report, if it was wrong or if it was right. The problem was they didn't even have the radiology reports. All they listened to is what the, the uh, oncologist said, because look at the quote. The management decision is made by the treating oncologist, and it's his opinion that counts. Are you kidding me? Doesn't people, don't people read the reports? Well, that's a real problem for us. So again, whatever the reason for the misdiagnosis is, we need to make certain that's not the case. We need to get the reports out in a timely fashion, and people need to read the reports. Perhaps we should have software which looks to see whether reports were actually read, and if they're not read, send a reminder, and the reminder doesn't work, make a phone call. And there's many communication errors. But you know, you wonder, what percent of your reports are never read? Think about that. You mail them. It goes into a black box. You never see it again. So those are some of the generic questions we have. Let's then move forward and let's look at specific areas of error. And let's start with the bladder. <laughs> 
Well, I'll tell you what. Let's take a two-minute break, and then we'll come back, and we'll start with the bladder. 